much and welcome everyone. I really appreciate your attendance today. First, I would like to acknowledge that we are working on the traditional and unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. We are thankful to be here today and to have the opportunity to work with the Comox First Nation collaboratively on many issues, including those critical to our community's future. The sewer service is one of those. We're, we're very grateful for Comox First Nations and their support of this project. I would like to acknowledge that Director Arzina Hamir, the Area Director for Electoral Area B, is with us today. As some of you may recall, in September last year, we engaged with the community to seek feedback on a list of three shortlisted conveyance options. The potential routes for pipes and pump stations that move our liquid waste from our communities to the treatment plant on Brent Road in Area B. During that consultation, we heard questions and concerns about groundwater, particularly in the Lazo area. To help address them, we hosted a webinar on November the 5th, specifically to talk about the groundwater assessments completed to date and what was to come. If you were part of that workshop, I thank you very much. I wish to say that this format is phenomenal for us. It enables us to receive questions from all of you and for all of you to receive the response. We as staff at the regional district really value face-to-face -face and one-on-one -on -one open houses. But in fact, COVID, if there is a positive, has resulted in these webinars, which allow us to share questions and answers with all of you to record those and make those available to the public. Also, it enables you to participate in this in your home, where I'm sure you're, it's far more convenient and more accessible for you to participate. Since we consulted with you, the Sewage Commission has selected a preferred conveyance option that includes tunneling in the Lazo area. We are here today to update you on the decision and walk you through the next steps for groundwater assessment, system design, and negotiating property rights of ways with those affected. Considerable work has been undertaken so far, and more is to come. Our project team is here to walk through these steps with you. We understand your concerns about groundwater, and we agree this work cannot and will not negatively impact our critical resource. Thank you for being here today and for being involved. Your engagement helps us ensure that the best decisions are being made in the Comox Valley Regional District. I encourage you to use the opportunities that you have tonight through chat or other ways to email to provide us with the questions that you have. Please ensure that we follow up and provide the answers that you have. And for those neighbors that were unable to attend tonight, please guide them to watch this when we make it available on our website. With that, I'll hand it over to Chris LaRose, our Senior Manager of Water and Wastewater Services, who will be presenting along with Dr. Gilles Wendling and our groundwater specialist. We look forward to answering any questions that you have. And again, thank you so much for your participation tonight. Great. Thank you, Russell. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here with you today to give an update on the Comox Valley Sewage Service Conveyance Project. I realize there are ongoing concerns from residents about the project, and I hope I can address at least some of those during today's presentation. So I appreciate those of you that have provided some questions in advance to help us uh, prepare and understand uh, what, your, what your concerns are. And I've done my best to incorporate answers into the presentation and I'm, and I'm ready to answer any other questions that are unresolved or triggered by the information that I'll share with you shortly. So we're striving for a shorter presentation today than last time to leave more room for questions. And as Russell mentioned, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Wendling and I will be sharing the presentation. So I'll, I'll, I'll get started. And then at, at some point I'll hand it over to, uh, to Gilles to uh, continue. And then I'll, I'll, I'll end with a description of the, um, the schedule moving forward from here. So first of all, I'm gonna start with an update on the process that we're working our way through and then describe the project in greater detail and what we're doing to mitigate uh, risk to your drinking water and, um, and set up a, 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 a reasonable process for uh, negotiating statutory right of ways with property owners. The next slide, please. So the CVRD launched a liquid waste management planning uh, process for the sewer service in 2018. So we're coming up on three years. Uh, so it's actually, it's been three years since that decision was made and three, it'll be three years in June uh, where we first reached out to the public to engage with, uh, with them on the process. And the objective of the plan is, is to work towards decommissioning of the 
Willamar Bluffs uh, section of Force Main, which has uh, long been, since been identified as a significant risk uh, due to the uh, falling beach levels, the erosion along that uh, section of beach. Um, so after a few years of ongoing technical analysis and public consultation, the CVRD has recently completed a series of decisions that will, that will allow us to kind of finalize this phase of the lift waste management plan uh, for submittal to the province later this year. So this graphic here, um, I'll just walk you, walk you through briefly. So an acknowledgement of uh, that some of the people on the call today uh, likely were not uh, here at our November 5th virtual open house. Um, so um, towards the beginning of the process, uh, a long list, uh, and this is inherent to the liquid waste management planning process. Um, it uh, starts with kind of casting the net far and wide and looking at uh, all, you know, all possible solutions to the, solution, to, to the problem, and then walking through a methodical process of engagement and analysis to reach a preferred solution. So you see the long list on the far left and the preferred option uh, on, on the right. So, um, so starting with that long list, we, we did assess or identify a number of options on, on how to get the wastewater from our two major pump stations to the treatment plant. Um, and then we, working with a technical and public advisory committee that was formed to help guide the process, um, and the PAC, the public advisory committee, did involve, uh, did include um, uh, two members of the public from each of the participating areas, so Courtney and Comox, and then also Area B, just given the impacts of uh, the, the infrastructure on, on that electoral area. Um, and so in addition to those six members of the public, there was also representation from uh, the business sector, the environmental sector, local government, First Nations, um, Shelfers Growers Association, Underwater Harvesters, and then the TAC was, a, was more of a local government and senior levels of government. Um, so helping with their guidance and input from uh, periodic public engagement, we screened, we developed goals and objectives for the process, um, and then an evaluation process and criteria, which we first applied to shortlist that long list to, uh, to a shortlist. Um, and so we selected three options uh, early last year. And those ones, just very briefly, um, well, they, they all included uh, going up and over or through the, the Lazo Hill. So just focusing in on the area that I think you're most concerned about. Um, but they differed in how, in how they did that. Um, so, um, and then also there was, a, there was a phasing element. But all three options included uh, going over or through Lazo Hill right from the start. Um, and uh, they just differed in whether they went over, so cut and cover along the roadways or uh, tunneling through, through Lazo Hill. So then um, we had planned to initiate a public engagement process on those three shortlisted options uh, early last year, but COVID the pandemic intervened and we were forced to delay that process by approximately five or six months until the fall. Um, so, that's, so that's when it ended up happening, September, October, of last year, we did go out to the public in an intensive uh, five or six week process, um, encouraging the public to, to submit surveys, uh, review the information packages, um, and, uh, and then we had um, a couple in-person uh, open houses and a virtual open house as well. So that information was fed into the final evaluation by the TAC pack of the, um, the three options. So that's the October 2020. Um, and so shortly after that was when we met to last um, or last had the virtual open house uh, in area B. Um, so just, just prior to that, the, the TAC and the PAC had voted to eliminate the cut and cover option and just um, essentially refer options two and three to the sewage commission or back to staff and to the sewage commission. So options two and three look very much the same to Lazo Hill. They both involve the horizontal directional drilled um, tunnel effectively through the hill to avoid having to go up and over the hill. And so that decision was, or that recommendation came out of the TAC and the PAC at, at the end of October. So between then and, uh, and February, we took the opportunity to do further technical evaluation uh, with, a, with a strong focus on, on uh, value engineering. So we, we introduced a, um, we, we brought on a team that specializes in value engineering. So this is a, a team of experts 
from pull, pulled together from around North America that are um, that are facilitated through a one week workshop where they review the scope in detail and uh, and and with a focus on identifying risks or opportunities for reducing uh, project risks or costs. Uh, so that process was done in December and that prompted uh, some some further analysis. Um, and that led us uh, through to, to a, a, an implementation decision uh, brought to the Commission uh, on February 23rd in uh, last month. And so the option that uh, ended up rising to the top uh, was option two. Um, option three fell off. Option three was a phased approach, uh, which would have seen uh, continued use of the existing foreshore force main uh, between, the court, between Courtney and Comox. Uh, so that's our that's our approach moving forward. Is uh, we've we've focused on option two, and that delivery of the project in a single phase using a tunnel to tunnels to cut through the two heights of land. If we go to the next slide, we have a, a graphic that I can just walk you through quickly, and then we'll focus in on on the area B component that I know you're most concerned about. So this project um, is primarily uh, geared, as I mentioned, to resolve the um, section of, uh, of or decommission the section of force main along the Wilmer Bluffs um, and um, and upgrade and increase the capacity of our two pump stations. So the project will involve uh, replacement of the Courtney pump station. So going from left to right, replacement of the Courtney pump station, um, a cut and cover installation of a new force main along Comox Road um, through the Comox First Nation. Um, and then uh, a short section of horizontal directional drilled tunnel through Comox Hill to shave off the peak of, uh, of land there. And um, you'll note that both uh, tunneled sections on this map are highlighted with a bit of a, uh, of a wide swath. And that's just to highlight the uncertainty that, uh, that exists about the exact alignment. So that's the, that, will be, that will be defined and confirmed through the, um, uh, further analysis this year. Uh, so after that uh, short section of HDD that comes out right on the east side of, uh, of the St. Joe's property, there'll be a cut and cover um, uh, pipeline project through the downtown core of, of Comox, uh, picking up the flow from the Jane Place station, which is right in the center of the screen, which will all, that station will be upgraded. And then all the way over to Torrance and, and Lazo. And that's where you see the start of that uh, second uh, larger swath of area that's been highlighted as potentially um, containing the horizontal directional drilled alignment. And then uh, surfacing at the treatment plant where the connection will be made. So if you go to the next slide, please. So this is zooming in on that swath that was identified. So on the far left, we have uh, Torrance. Um, and on the right, we have the treatment plant site and then the Curtis Road neighborhood uh, between the site and, and the ocean. So the, uh, the concept of the SWAT is, uh, is just in acknowledgement of the fact that we, we haven't yet nailed down the precise alignment that uh, the tunnel will follow through, through Lazo Hill. And that's uh, for two, two, two primary reasons. One is that we're, um, we're still assessing whether to do this in a, in a, uh, um, in, in a two, HDD um, combination that was communicated to you last year. So that would involve the tunnel uh, going from Torrance and Balmoral over to Moreland, uh, down up Moreland, and then under the marsh over to the treatment plant, or if we will deliver it as a single tunnel all the way from Torrance to the treatment plant. And that's that explains this kind of funny shape that the swath has. So that analysis is ongoing, but we certainly Playing a significant uh, input to that is the strong feedback we've received about the significant impacts that would be expected along Moreland, you know, from the surfacing of the horizontal, so the exit pit, the trench and cover down Moreland, and then the, the potential impact to the marsh in that area. So that is definitely something we heard loud and clear in the process to date. And certainly that would be an advantage of considering a single alignment between the two. The other consideration uh, that, and the other reason why we, we, we haven't yet uh, nailed down the precise alignment is because we really need to understand exactly where the drinking water wells are in this area. So as th this map, um, just very briefly, so the different colored dots, um, the blue dots are wells that are registered in the BC database. And then the purple and green 
holes are or dots are um, the boreholes that were that were done as part of the geotechnical investigations last year. Um, so just drawing your attention back to the blue dots, though, what you'll notice very quickly is that um, um, many of the rural properties here uh, don't have a blue dot. So I think that's that's you know, um, that's because the, the the wells are either old enough that they weren't entered into the BC registry of, of wells or they were done um, informally. Um, so we really need to, uh, to understand exactly where those wells are. So just referring you back to that letter that was received uh, about a couple of weeks ago that was sent out to the, to the properties within the swath, just asking for your permission to provide your contact information to uh, Gilles Wending and his, and his, uh, his company, GW Solutions. Um, to come out and do an inventory of the wells. And what we're really after there is under, understanding exactly where, so the, kind of the, the, the GPS uh, um, coordinates of your well, so exactly where and then how deep. And so both of those pieces of information are, are, are needed to allow us to plot a, uh, a, a, an alignment through this area that stays the required distance away from uh, drinking water wells. Um, and so once that's complete, then Gilles and his, his team would update the 3D model that's been developed for the Lazo Hill um, and, uh, and allow us to, 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 to uh, finalize that alignment. Um, next slide, please. So we've, um, so through a combination of the feedback we received through the public engagement process last year, uh, last fall, um, the questions and, and, um, and emails that came in around the November 5th public open house, and then the questions that have come to us over the past uh, few days and lead up to this event. I've kind of summarized here the, the concerns that we've been hearing from residents. Um, you know, the first one is, you know, you know, primarily is the concerns about the risk to groundwater quality. Um, and then, you know, secondary to that, but still significant, is our concerns about the impact on quantity, and th those those uh, mostly come from residents that have shallow wells that are concerned that installation of the pipe will compromise the layers that that hold that those shallow aquifers up, and and cause a decrease in in water quantity. So, so speaking to, to that one. Um, the, the CBRD, you know, as I highlighted it in the November 5th meeting, the CBRD is, is committed to installing you know, and engineering and, and installing the most robust um, system possible through this, uh, through this piece of, uh, of, of, of land. We, are, we, we, are, um, we fully acknowledge the concerns from residents um, and uh, we, we want to reassure you that every Every possible measure is being taken to ensure that what gets installed in the ground is as robust, robust as possible. And as I highlighted in our, our previous presentation, you know our interests fully align with the residents in this case. Um, you know we we have we have every interest in ensuring that that pipe is as robust as possible, and uh, and you know doesn't fail, doesn't leak. This is a you know, an incredibly critical piece of infrastructure for the service. In, just as our existing pipe is the sole means of conveying the vast majority of Courtney and Comox wastewater to the plant, so will this new pipe. Um, so we, we will be taking every measure possible for that reason and for the protection of groundwater to ensure that what gets installed on the ground is, 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 is extremely robust. We will be working to establish a base through, through the work with Gilles so that uh, he'll touch on in, in, in subsequent slides working to establish that baseline of water quality and quantity in the area. So we're intent on, on having you know, a year's worth of data collected, hopefully before, um, before well before the start of construction. So that um, um, that forms a, a very robust baseline um, and then do, to do ongoing monitoring during construction and after construction where the results can be compared back against this baseline to, to, to provide a very kind of a clear assessment of, of any potential impacts. Um, we're committed to a third party review of the preliminary design assumptions. So we've, we, we did undertake that value engineering process to increase the robustness of the process. Um, we've, we're committed to, to, to building the, the, the line as we're required to, uh, to the most up-to-date seismic standards 
um, and you know, where, where, where possible, you know, exceeding those standards. And, and just as a, a brief reminder of what I mentioned in, uh, in early November, you know, that those standards require that we design this infrastructure to uh, a 2,475 20, year return earthquake. So here on the coast, we often talk about the big one, um, and, you know, and, and, but that, and, and that the return period on that one is about 300 years. Well, the, 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 the seismic standards require us to, to install this infrastructure to a 2,400 year return earthquake, which is much, much more significant. Um, another piece that I mentioned previously, which I'll reiterate here is the pressure test. So before that pipe is, is installed, it, uh, and while it's laying on the ground at one end of the tunnel, it's a, it undergoes a full hydrostatic pressure test um, prior to being drawn into the hill and then after as well. And then we're, we're, we continue to examine options for a real-time leak detection um, that could be installed uh, to help us monitor and provide additional reassurance to the, the local community. Um, so second question, you know, so what if there is a leak? What if, what if everything goes wrong and everything you, you know, I've just said, you know, something, there was an un unforeseen flaw or un un unanticipated situation. Um, so we have done, we've done a fair bit of work with, with Gilles and his team and we, we continue to do so. Um, but I think what, you know, what one, one thing we, we want to highlight here is that um, the, the pipe installed via horizontal directional drill uh, will pass. And I had a, a graphic for this in the last, uh, last presentation, but uh, just a cross, showing a cross section of the hill. Um, so the, the, the pipe is anticipated to run about to a minimum of 10 or 12 meters above the water level in the Quadrasands aquifer. So if in the, in the extremely unlikely event that there, there was a leak, so Gilles and his team indicates that uh, you know, we're looking at weeks to months for of time required for that, uh, that wastewater that's leaking out of the pipe to, to filter down through that highly compacted uh, Quadrasands layer before getting to the water layer. And the reason that's significant is because um, you know, once into the, into the, to the, to the groundwater, uh, that, that material would travel quite a bit quicker because it has an opportunity to dilute within the water. But having that 10, 10 12 plus meters of, of, of sand provides a, a very significant filtration effect. The leak monitoring would allow us to, to pick up on that uh, leak much sooner. And then that, that layer of, uh, of, of dry sand would provide us time to, to respond. So you know, we, we're, we're committing to you know, like I say, in the very unlikely event that a leak were to occur, communicating even a possibility of a leak and monitoring for impacts in the surrounding area um, and undertaking all necessary measures to resolve as quickly as possible. Now, again, I, I, I raise that because of the concerns that have been raised, not because we believe there's, there's, there's any significant risk of this, of this happening. Uh, the third bullet is regarding the statutory right-of-way process. So we've also heard some anxieties or some concerns about uh, the prospect or you know, how, how that might uh, be achieved and then the, um, the impact on kind of constrained rights of use on the property. So how that might affect your use of the property and then also how that might affect the property value. So first of all, speaking to the process, um, once we've, uh, and as highlighted on the last slide on the timeline, we're looking to nail down the pipe alignment towards the end of summer or early fall. So once that's been done, we will then reach out to property owners who are directly above that alignment and, uh, and begin that negotiation. So this is an individual negotiation with each property owner. So we'll be meeting, we, we would be meeting individually uh, to have a, a unique negotiation for each property. Uh, so that's a little bit about the timing and the process. And, and so what's being, what would be proposed here is, um, is, is different from a typical statutory right of way that's done on surface through a cut and cover, which uh, typically in terms of what rights are restricted to the, to the property owner, you know, you would see a restriction on, on building within a three meter offset. So not building on top, not planting any large trees would be pretty typical uh, in addition to not excavating or, or poking holes in it, of course. Um, but in this case, the, given that the pipe will be so deep, um, the restrictions on use above will be significantly lower and, and, and could just be 
restricted to not drilling a well within um, say three meters of a center line of that pipe or potentially potentially closer to five. Um, so that could be the extent of, of the restrictions on use above that above that uh, the pipe. So in other words, restrictions on, on building on top of the pipe not likely to, to exist. Um, and then so further to the, to the last point, the inherent to that uh, negotiation is compensation for the statutory right of way. So and that's that's meant to be commensurate with the with any loss of use of the property. And that's again, that's related to the restriction of rights. Um, so inherent to that process is compensation to uh, just to re reiterate that there will be compensation built into that for the loss of rights uh, along that section of, uh, of, of line and any loss in, in property value can be brought into can be brought into that process. The graphic at the bottom of the slide here um, is just intended to provide a little bit of a background regarding the horizontal directional drilling process. And we can come back to that if there are any questions. So maybe I'll uh, ask Gilles now to uh, to, to uh, present his slides, and um, and then I'll be uh, there back with you to present the last slide, and then available for questions after. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. And I have a few uh, slides just to uh, provide an outline of what we intend to do. So, of course, the, the intent is to um, refine the understanding of the groundwater regime, the groundwater dynamic, uh, through additional collection of information and also plan for the characterization and monitoring of the shallow groundwater and the deeper groundwater. So because we have shallow wells and we have deep wells. So we want to um, finalize our collection of information on wells. We have already have access to the provincial database and to other uh, local area information, but definitely through well owners information, we will uh, improve and complete this um, database on existing wells. And we want to select shallow wells and deep wells, which will be part of the network for monitoring the, the quality of the water over time. And we'll also monitor the water levels. So uh, as indicated on the sign pre-construction, the selection of the wells will be a key task. Uh, gathering information to define the baseline water quality will be critical because this is what will be used to compare water quality over time and to see if there is any modification, deterioration of the water quality over time that could potentially be leaked, uh, linked to, uh, to a potential leak, because I, we know that this is a, a worry that people have, which is valid. So uh, we'll have uh, data loggers installed in selected wells and they will measure temperature, depth to water, and also salinity, which will be an indication, which will be the key parameter that we'll track. Uh, of course, uh, we'll uh, assume, uh, as information is collected, uh, we'll update the database and we'll improve the knowledge. During and post construction, so we will definitely keep a very close eyes on the water quality and we will update the information on a regular basis should we notice uh, a trend or an uh, increase in uh, total disulfides, for example, and, and, and conductivity, then we will report that to the regional district saying, you know, that there is a change here and what is the cause of that change? So we will definitely uh, keep focus if we see any anomaly. Next slide. So we, this slide just shows what uh, we are in the process of doing and what we have completed. When the box is highlighted in green, it means that we have completed the task. Uh, 
So in terms of accessing the provincial database, we have done that. We have refined the 3D model and we have drawn cross section that allow us to uh, better understand what we are dealing with. And we'll, I will finish my presentation with an illustration of one cross section so you understand what it is. And uh, we, so we are um, working with the regional district and with the response that we are starting to get from well owners to build this network and select the, the best wells to monitor both the shallow water and the, the deep groundwater. Uh, one of the key next tasks for us is to visit the, the properties, uh, meet the net owners, and then uh, collect additional information on the wells, uh, should they be available, and then deploy this equipment that will monitor the water quality. And then, as I mentioned, we will keep collecting information pre-construction, during construction and post-construction to have really the, the big picture. And of course, this will be done through continuous uh, reporting and communication. Next slide, please. So the, the tasks that we have completed, I showed them in boxes here in, in, in text. So we have uh, a good 3D model for the site. Uh, this has required cleaning, uh, which was available from the provincial database. Uh, I will discuss that further in my next slide. Um, we, we have also identified the parcels that we need to uh, consider and that would be included in the network. And uh, we are in the process of identifying and refining the selection of well that will be part of the network. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned that we had access to information from the provincial database and the provincial database data is, is in words. It's not uh, logs and illustrations and cartoons. So we need to, when we do this type of work, we need to interpret the information reported by the drillers when they drill the, the wells. And we need to create visuals. And logs are visuals which illustrate uh, the type of soils that the drillers encountered when they drilled, whether it's a dry soil, a wet soil, a fine soil, a clay, a silt, or sand, or a gravel. So we built the logs that illustrate, you'll see on the left side of the log, you have the type of soil that were encountered. And on the right side, there is an illustration of the well that was built with the upper part, which shows the seal, which is now required under the new groundwater protection regulations, which prevent uh, contamination from surface going along the casing of the well. And then you have the casing, the big tube, which is the casing of the well. And at the bottom, you see the screen which is where the well is actually in contact with the aquifer, which the water supply. So we have built those logs. And once we have logs like that, we can uh, connect them to other logs from other wells. Next slide, please. In order to come up with cross sections, which describe uh, a visual of the soil encountered, and then where the aquifer was encountered. So here you'll see the sand aquifer with the, the blue sandy uh, zone. So this is where we have relatively coarse sand that contain water and conduct water. Uh, below that, you have the sandy silt. So when you have silt uh, mixed with sand, it definitely and drastically reduces the size of the pores um, between the sand grains. And the conductivity can drop by a factor of like 100. So it's significant in terms of velocity uh, the, of the water through the sand. So the sand aquifer is a porous medium and a conductive medium. So you'll see the, all the logs that were drilled of the well that we drill and where the screen was installed at the bottom of the well. So you'll see that the screen is definitely in the sand aquifer. 
So we want uh, to monitor the quality of the water, the groundwater in the sand aquifer. So we'll do some manual sampling and the samples will be submitted to the lab on a regular basis to check that the quality is still the same. And as I mentioned, we'll have also equipment data loggers that will continuously, like every, every minute or every five minutes, will monitor information on pressure, water pressure, uh, water temperature, and electrical conductivity. And this will be downloaded on a regular basis and the downloaded information will be reviewed and we'll see that we'll check and make sure that we always have a, a, a same type of data. If we have any jump in the data, any trend in the data, that will be an indicator that we are observing a change in water quality. And this is what we'll use to assess if there is any impact on the groundwater or not. And I believe that was my last slide. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jules. Um, and one last slide for me before we, we get to the questions. So this is just a, a summary of our, of our next steps, a high level description of the project schedule moving forward. Um, so uh, first line is, um, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're striving to get a, a full year of, of hydrological data prior to construction uh, to form a, a robust baseline. So that's uh, starting as soon as possible. Um, and uh, stretching into next year. Um, also occurring this year will be a detailed design. Um, first of all, procuring the engineers and then working on the design and the statement of requirements. Um, in Starting in May and ending late June, early July, we uh, are planning to undertake an alternate approval process for authorizing the borrowing required for the project. Uh, so the, the current project cost estimate is, is, is 73 million, of which 52 million is uh, expected to be borrowed or up to a maximum, and that will be authorized by the AAP. The results expected in early July. Um, we'll work towards that uh, late summer, early fall uh, target that I mentioned for finalizing the project scope, including the, the pipeline alignment. Um, and then that will um, trigger the start of the uh, negotiations for statutory right-of-ways in, uh, like I say, in, in early fall. Um, early next year, we would uh, begin the procurement process to secure the, or select the contractor for the, uh, construction. And that uh, that's expected to take the bulk of, of 2022. And then construction could be expected, you know, the very, very first steps of construction could be expected in late 2022, but the bulk of construction will occur the following year in 2023. Um, and then be, uh, be finished the following year in 2024. Um, so that's it from us. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll hand you back over to Marcy to facilitate the question and answer period. Great. Thanks, Chris. Wow, that is um, a lot of information to process. We've got a lot of great questions coming through. Uh, I've got about 25, 26 on my list. So I'm going to go right to the first one. And these are a mix. Well, I've tried to group the questions together when they are on a, the same topic. Um, I'm hearing leaks is, uh, is, is, is interesting to people. People want information on the potential for leaks and how to repair a leak. But I'm gonna start at the top with the first question, Chris. If you're ready, uh, it's just basically about uh, directional. Where will the line progress from the Jane Place pump station? Um. So the, where will the line progress from the Jane? So the, the Jane Place station, currently the line goes uh, uh, towards the water from the station and ties into the foreshore force main. So when the new line is, is installed to cut and cover through the town, uh, there'll be a new, a new force main installed up Jane Place Road um, to tie into the new pipe on Beaufort. So that's the, uh, yeah, that's, that's what it'll look like. Okay, um, this may have been answered, but I'll, uh, out of respect. So wondering if the proposed route will handle all the sewage from Courtney, including Courtney East. So, um, so not all of it knows, but you know, it, approximately over 80%. So the construction of the Hudson and Greenwood trunk gravity lines uh, in 2018 um, 
did initially immediately divert some flow and that the amount of diversion is expected to grow um, late this year when uh, the city of Courtney completes uh, a major project to tie in a larger piece of East Courtney. But, um, but even so, even after the, that, uh, that, that improvement or that connection is made later this year, more than 80% of, of, of Courtney flows will still flow through Courtney pump station and therefore through this new line. And then uh, in the town of Comox, si similar proportion, there is a little bit of, um, of, of the town that drains to the Colby station at the end of Colby Road, um, and then also down to the Hudson trunk. But again, roughly 90% of flows um, from Comox run through the Jane Play station. That proportion will change over the years as, as there's more development expected um, in, in the Northeast Comox, uh, which will drain by gravity through the Hudson and through the CFB pump station directly to the plant. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so people are curious about how deep the single tunnel will be. And as part of that, how do you repair a leak in a tunnel that is so deep and, and if it happens to be under someone's house? Yeah, so first of all, how deep? Um, so the, the, the depth will, will vary um, you know, from, from three meters, which you know the approximate depth above the, or of the pipe at either end um, to a maximum of 30 meters. So roughly that 100 feet mark. Um, so I mean, it, the answer is that you know, we're, we're building this, this pipe to, to avoid ever having to do that. Um, in the, in the extremely unlikely event that we do see a leak at the deepest section, then it would be a major undertaking, you know, no, no, no doubt about that. It would be a very major undertaking to repair. And if it, if it, if it did happen to be um, underneath a structure at that time, then, then um, options would be assessed of whether, you know, going straight down or, or at an angle, um, but any impacts to property properties or, or structures obviously would be you know, fully compensated by the RD. Okay, um, some questions around drilling and actually logistics during construction. So do you have a sense of where the staging area might be for all of this pipe when things get underway? And then in terms of drilling, how long will the drilling take? What time of year could it happen or, or is it planned to happen? And what would the noise issues be related to that? Would, will it be a noise nuisance for, for the neighborhood? Okay, lots of uh, <laughs> lots of pieces yeah. to that to that question. Um, so the um, in terms of impact from the from the entry and exit pits, um, so they are fairly fairly significant, and it does depend on on. So I, and I highlighted in the presentation that there's uncertainty still over whether it'll be two separate horizontal directional drill alignments or or one, um, and uh, and then so therefore some uncertainty over over where the ent entry and exit pits will be. So, um, but regardless of where they are, uh, they, they are a fairly major operation. So, um, you know, you're looking at a, we're looking at a, a footprint of, you know, roughly 50 by hundred feet, um, more if they, if they can take it, less if, if there isn't, depending on, on, on exactly where these, uh, where the entry and exit pits are. Um, there's a, a very large drilling unit set up, and then there's some um, supporting auxiliary systems for supplying the bentonite slurry, filtering out the, the sand and gravel that's, that's excavated, um, and, and a whole host of other supporting kind of systems. Um, so that, you know, that, as with the rest of the construction, you know, that, that uh, the noise and impacts you know, would be restricted to, you know, to business hours um, to avoid, um, excessive impacts to, to, lo to the local neighborhood. The duration of that work, um, so the, the timeline that I mentioned for construction on the last, last slide there, that was for the entire project. The tunneling itself um, is, a, is, a, is a significantly briefer um, process. And exactly when that happens within that year and a half or two years is, it will be determined in large part by the, by, by the contractor. But you know, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, approximately a four or five month process uh, to drill and install the pipe. Um, so I think another part of that question was, you know, where does the pipe lay down happen? So the pipe actually gets assembled, fully assembled on the surface before being dragged or drawn through the, um, through the tunnel. Um, so that, you know, as, and, and as communicated in, in early November, that is a, 
and through the public engagement process that lay down, you know, could have impacts depending on where it is, could have uh, impacts on flow of traffic and uh, foot and vehicle traffic. Um, so the, the alignment that was communicated late last year was, was relating to the two tunnel option. And that lay down was along Bull Moral, stretching from, um, from Torrance all the way through to the other side of the, the golf course. Um, if, uh, if, if we shift to the single alignment, other options for lay down uh, occur. So the lay down impacts will be more on the order of seven or eight weeks. Uh, so just a fraction of the time taking up with tunneling. Um, so that's the time that required to assemble the pipe, weld it, quality control all of the all of the welds, um, pressure test it, and then get it ready for, for being. And then and then the actual process of drawing it through the hill as well. I think I covered off all of those pieces. That, uh, Did I miss it? I think you you hit them, and it sounds like there's there'll be more timing available as we get closer to things. Um, let's switch to um, statutory right of way. This seems to be of interest, of course, to many. Uh, one of the suggestions is uh, could sorting out the statutory right of way compensation be done as a group in advance? And maybe I guess the question is, has that been considered or is that being discussed? Um, no, I mean, I, it, I don't think it's out of the question. I think um, we're actually in the process of engaging a, a properties agent right now. So that individual is being selected based on their expertise, you know, with, with similar projects and similar statutory right of ways. So specifically ones for, for, tun for tunnels. Um, so our intention is to, um, you know, to, to draw heavily on their expertise and just how best, you know, the best practices for negotiating these, these agreements. Um, so, you know, from what I understand, these are typically done individually, um, but, you know, that's not out of the question. We'll, we'll certainly receive that, that question and that input and see if there's any opportunities for any type of group component. But I think there is, there's a sufficient differences between properties and, and situations that, um, uh, it, which I think explains why these are typically done on an individual basis. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've got a few different questions around water quality and testing and, and who's responsible. Um, so monitoring the health of our water, is this up to the individual individuals to have it tested or would this be the regional district? And as part of that, um, someone asking about the TDS readings, total dissolved solids, are those gonna be recorded before and after drilling? So uh, two questions put into one for you around water quality. Sure, I think maybe I'll take the first one and then maybe ask Gilles to, uh, to comment on the second one or, or maybe even help me with the first. Um, so in terms of uh, you know, whether you'll be responsible for your own monitoring, I think, I mean, our intention is to, I mean, first of all, inventory all of the wells in that, within that swath, um, but then to follow up and install, as, as Gilles highlighted, install the monitoring equipment on on a fraction of those, so not you know, it, it is quite expensive to install that real-time monitoring equipment. So I think the intention right now is to choose six wells that are geographically uh, spread out and and cover um, um, you know, cover a representative uh, section of of the aquifer, um, and then so that's you know that's largely for 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 developing the baseline, and then. And then they, they continue to be used for the monitoring during and after construction. So if the question is is relating to, you know, what if other properties that don't have that monitoring, you know, whether you know whether we would support um, taking more of a kind of a grab sample, you know, before, during, and after. You know, certainly we can we can speak to that. We can speak about that. I think the, the project would likely be open to that. But the more data, the better. Um, but I'll, maybe I'll ask Jules to, to speak to that. And then also the second question about the TDS. Yeah, so I think what, I'm going to put my video too. Um, yeah, I think so, so the, the intent is to have an understanding of, uh, you know, the baseline and also if there is any change over time. So to have a baseline, which is roughly a year uh, if you consider maybe quality sampling in terms of water quality uh, and particular bacteriological analysis. So we make sure that we have a good understanding of what we are dealing with. And when we start construction, we will keep um, sampling 
I believe probably quarterly would be, and so every three months would be um, good in order to see if we need any, any change over time. Because it takes time for water quality to change uh, due to the slow velocity and the slow movement of ground of groundwater in in aquifers so if we take on a, every day we, we won't see much if we we have to wait a long enough period of time to notice any modification so so uh, a, a quarterly sampling would probably be uh, um, good for this uh, for this project and relevant for the project to assess the change in water quality. And as Chris mentioned, we'll have the real-time equipment that will measure uh, several times a day. And, and then we can always uh, look at that and see if we need, if we see any changes with this specific equipment. And TDS is an uh, indi indicator of the, uh, the, almost like the turbidity of water, but I mentioned bacteriological analysis will be very specific to the to the the, the waste, uh, to the the potential contamination, uh, electrical conductivity is also a very good indicator because if we have waste, you have the change, you have like salts and and uh, which are released, and that will affect electrical conductivity. So these are parameters that are very good to track the potential impact of liquid waste. Thank you. Okay. Um, now on to sort of water levels. This one came in by email earlier today. Uh, just asking about what studies have been conducted that look at the groundwater level in the past and, and now, and with this new uh, proposed routing, um, will there be a chance to figure out the new groundwater levels, uh, for example, at the end of summer? So I think people um, wanting to know if their water levels will be impacted, especially in that dry end of summer season. Um, Chris or Gilles, any, any comments towards that? Yeah, in terms of water levels, uh, it will be part of the monitoring process because this is one of the key parameters that uh, we want to follow up and we want to monitor. Uh, we don't expect any modification of the groundwater level for the deep aquifers, for the deep wells. Uh, for the shallow wells, it will definitely be something that we will monitor. And uh, we don't you know, anticipate because the, the fact that the, the drilling and the rimming of the pipe will uh, create a compaction of the soil around the pipe so we don't anticipate that there will be pathways for the shallow groundwater to move and to, to leave the, the local aquifers. So we don't anticipate that, but definitely we will keep monitoring the water table in the shallow, uh, shallow wells and making sure that we don't see any um, modification beyond the seasonal fluctuation that we can, we observe and we we monitor and we will monitor. Okay, um, I'll just say we're at 529, but we are going to stay on because there's still a lot of questions. If any of you have to hop off uh, the call, uh, we will be posting uh, the recording on CBRD Connect. So uh, do check back in. And if we don't get to questions during the session, we will be posting them in paper format, the answers afterwards. So if you're wondering, or if your questions haven't, haven't been answered yet, but you need to jump off, that's uh, our promise to you that the CBRD will get back in touch and post the answers. Um, so a quick, easy one here. Um, if people haven't submitted their well location yet, or if it's not appearing in some of the slide imagery or maps, where would they do that? Or who would they contact? Um, yes, what we, what we asked residents to do is just to conf I guess respond with their uh, support for being contacted by Gilles and his team. Um, so that's uh, we are we are looking to ground truth each each well, um, just to just to be absolutely certain of the of the location to help us with the, with the design. Um, so I guess the um, the so if they could if residents could respond to the email address or telephone number that was provided in the in the letter that would be the uh, the best best way. Okay, um, quick one, or not necessarily quick, but groundwater runoff. Apparently there are issues in the area. Will this project impact groundwater runoff? 
so so I think um, you know groundwater to me groundwater runoff you know speaks to surface flow of, of, of groundwater so um, given that uh, the selected or preferred solution is does involve tunneling through the hill I, I don't there's there's just zero overlap between you know, surface flows and, and where this pipe will be um, I think that's that that tends to be more of a concern with um, with a trench and cover project. Um, so with you know with a trench and cover installation, a, a trench is dug, so the, the native material is, is excavated, and then there's bedding material, which is typically sand, is laid down in the trench. The pipe is put on top, and then sand is compacted around it. Even though it's compacted, um, it still it still has some porosity, and um, and that and then that trench can actually act to short circuit the flow of water. And so when 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 that's known to be an issue, or there's 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 uh, sensitive groundwater in an area, then what they'll do is they'll actually install um, clay dams around the the pipe at at frequencies or kind of intervals along the pipe, and that's to stop the flow of groundwater along the pipe. So as I said, this is a tunneled alignment, um, completely different installation. And as as Jill's highlighted, and I'll just reiterate this, maybe add a little bit more detail. When the pipe, the way that the pipe is installed, um, it, it uses a, a clay product called bentonite, which is a very fine clay that's um, that's um, kind of mixed with water to, to create a very slippery fluid, um, and that is what uh, that's what lubricates the drill bit as it goes back and forth through the hole, and um, and and acts like the um, the medium for removing the, the sand and gravel, and also kind of presses into the the surrounding um, media. And then uh, when the hole's fit finished and they pull the pipe through, it acts like a lubricant. But once that pipe stops, that clay solidifies and expands. And you know, and as so as Jules mentioned, what 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 ends up what you end up with is a is a zone of, of lower permeability around that pipe. And because of the compression from the drilling process and that clay. So the the pipe itself, the installation, you know, will, you know, I, I heard Jill speak very confidently to this, and I will echo that. You know, there, there there's there's zero prospect of water being conveyed along this this finished pipe alignment, whether it be um, you know uh, surface flows or, uh, or 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 shallow aqu shallow aquifer flows. Okay, um, I think there is still a fair bit of concern or questions uh, about a leak, a potential leak, and we've talked about leaks, but are you able to do a hypothetical answer? What if there's a leak and what if there is, the water is contaminated? Um, hypothetical question, but would you like to tackle that? It is uh, coming up in some of the questions for sure. Okay, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, as, you know, as, I've, as I've tried to highlight, you know, that you know, our, you know, we, we, you know, for, for both for water protection in that area, as well as risk mitigation for the service, um, you know, we'll, we'll be doing everything within our power to install a, a system here that is extremely robust, including, you know, up to those major, major long period return uh, seismic events. Um, so we are doing everything possible to avoid the, the possibility of a leak. In that extremely unlikely event that there is a leak, this, the CVRD is committed to you know, to, to, to this ongoing monitoring in an immediate communication in response to the public and taking you know, whatever steps necessary to ensure a safe supply of drinking water in that in that area. So what exactly that looks like, you know, we haven't we haven't uh, we haven't assessed or, or got into the details, but I think that's you know that's a that's a, 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 commitment, a commitment that can be made. And uh, Marcy, I, I'd just like to add to that. And thank you for your answer, Chris. And, and thank you residents for those types of questions. And I just wanna say that the regional district is really committed as Chris, Chris has explained. We're committed to designing and implementing the best possible technology and, uh, and construction practices to put in a pipe that will not leak. But in, in, the un, uh, in the event that anything were to happen, the regional district would be responsible. And I think this is the importance of Gilles' work and the commitment we're doing to undertake the uh, hydrogeological analysis and really have a thorough understanding and knowledge 
of the uh, hydrology and circumstances that exist today so that we have that as a baseline to help us manage this moving forward. But uh, in the event of an unlikely catastrophe such as that, the regional district will be whole and will be responsible. Okay, thanks Russell for chiming in there. Um... Someone is also asking, what is the age of the current pipe or the pipe along the bluff? How long has that lasted or how old is, is that pipe? That, uh, that pipe was installed in um, 1982, 1983. So it's coming up on 40 years old. And the, the first problems um, along the section of Wilmer Bluffs were identified in 2003 when it was found that uh, uh, about ten per, or you know, five to ten percent of the of that length had become exposed um, through that kind of loss of, of cover and the gradual erosion of the of the beach along below Willamar Bluffs. Um, so it's been you know coming up on twenty years since that was initially identified. We've taken measures to to mitigate the risk in the interim, um, but that is what's driving the the urgency behind this project is decommissioning that section. Okay. I'm going to move a little bit to some money questions because I'm seeing uh, tax questions come up. Um, some questions around tax increases to pay for the work and questions around will the increases um, apply only to those who benefit from the system or and there are some other um, questions around increase of property taxes. Um, wondering if it's just for those properties that the benefit from the installation than those who don't. Um, Chris, this is a tax question and, and uh, feel free to, um, we can seek an answer later, but if you want to tackle it, go for it. There's a few asking. Yeah, sure, I, 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 can, I can definitely uh, answer that. So the, yeah, Great. so very, very simply, only the residents, um, only the users of the system will bear the, the, the cost of this, of this um, this project, um, so that's been estimated at approximately $150 per property per year um, for the 20-year amortization period of the, the $52 million in borrowing. So that's only residents within the sewer service area. So electoral area B residents will will see not a not a not a cent of tax increase uh, related to this project. Great, thank you. And another uh, money related question from email earlier, wondering about the savings of this chosen route compared to some of the other options or the value um, of this, this choice compared to the others. Sure, so I mean, so I think um, on, on the short list, this, this, uh, this project is the least expensive, but as I highlighted, um, so least expensive from a capital and a life cycle perspective. But as I highlighted um, earlier, um, all three of the shortlisted options involve either cutting up and over or through Lazo Hill. Um, so if you look farther back to the long list, um, there were options there that, that didn't involve cutting across Lazo Hill, but they were very quickly removed from the process um, for you know, largely, well, largely non-cost related uh, um, reasons of, for example, you know the options that um, that would see us would have seen us put a new pipe along the foreshore. You know because we were we were like I mentioned before focused on on casting the net far and wide, ensuring that that all possible options were assessed, so that you know to ensure the rigor of the process and ensure that we didn't get you know, very far down the process and and, and then have a, another option come up and and have to backtrack. So th those those estuary options were quickly. You know, it quickly became clear that there was there was no appetite or support from the public um, for the for the reinstallation of, of you know the the you know, new impacts to the foreshore um, and you know potentially having a, a similar risk materialize in another 40 years. So those ones were quickly re removed and and not because of, of of cost factors. An example of a of a um, of a of an option or two options. That were removed um, largely due to costs would be the concept of a centralized treatment facility um, in Courtney. So effectively, you know, stop upgrading the the Brent Road facility, build a new plant in in Courtney. Um, so that one was was removed because of cost, but it was you know it was it was, it was significantly uh, more expensive 
um, and constrained by the reality that um, you know, similar to the, the strong opposition to running a, a pipe through the edge of the estuary again, uh, the concept of, of discharging even highly, highly treated wastewater to the estuary was just a, a, a no-go. So that, that project would have required a, still required a pipeline from that uh, plant out uh, across area B to, to be discharged off the existing uh, outfall at Cape Lazo. Um, you know, and, and the costs were you know, on the order of, of $150 million. Um, so, so for the most part, what's led us to, to this short list and the, and the need to, to cut across the area B is, is, is a lack of other um, realistic options. So we're not talking about uh, you know, having eliminated uh, options that, um, you know, that had a, had, a, had a marginal financial benefit. That would have avoided these impacts. Uh, really, we're, we're we're looking at a, at a short list, um, you know that uh, that led to um, that, you know that didn't deliver any viable alternatives to going through this part of Area B. You know, in short. Okay, thank you. Um, question related to the Lazo Marsh and the Bird Sanctuary. Uh, wondering how sewage discharge would be prevented from entering that environmentally sensitive area. Again, in the, yeah, so, in, I mean, it's the same. Yeah, in the event of a leak. Yeah, so it's the or, same. Yeah. yeah, it's the same. Same. I was going to say it's related to the you know the response that provided provided regarding the leaks. This 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 uh, the system is being you know as as Russell also highlighted will be is being engineered and will be installed to the highest possible standards. Um, I, I I I think the the question probably um, stems from the the currently communicated concept of of um, the two HDD alignment option. So I said we were all, we were all are also assessing an alternative single alignment, which would uh, significantly also significantly reduce the impact to either side of the of the marsh, as it would it would pass quite far underneath it, and end up at the plant. But if we do proceed with the the option that was previously communicated, and end up cutting and covering along um, moorland and then horizontal directional drill under the marsh. It's all it will all be built to that same standard, um, and um, and and the same monitoring. Right. Okay. Some quick ones here. Um, does the waste flow down Ryan Road to the Courtney Pump Station and then get pumped back up? So, um, so the city, so the, the regional district um, manages the regional conveyance and treatment system. The municipalities are responsible for their their own collection systems. Um, so, um, with the exception of several small catchment areas uh, in East Courtney that have already been uh, connected to the Hudson and Greenwood, and then that other larger catchment area around the Home Depot area, the, the hospital, and some of that residential in that area, which will which will soon drain to the Greenwood, everything else drains down to um, to the Courtney Pump Station. Yes. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead to a question that's relevant and hasn't been asked yet, and I think it relates to the process, uh, alternate approval process. Uh, the question is, what what avenue do Area B residents have to express their opposition to this project? And this might be a good time to um, discuss the upcoming process and the options available uh, in terms of consultation or the perhaps the AAP. I'll, I'll pass that to you. Back to you. Yeah, and uh, I'll take that one, Chris. And uh, thank you very much for the question. I just want to emphasize the need for this project to proceed. And uh, we have got here today from an extensive public process, receiving public input through open houses, the consideration of long list, short list. And uh, what we really value is the input that was provided to us from the uh, public advisory committee, members of the community representing Area B, residents of Courtney, Comox and others, other interests within our, within our community that vetted the long list and short list and helped us come to this, this uh, this uh, preferred option. Um, in the event that Area B residents have any doubts or any questions about this project and the need for it, please don't hesitate to reach out to us as staff. Myself, Chris, and others that stand behind us to support this project are there to answer your questions. But the conveyance and treatment of sewage for the entire Comox Valley is so important. We must rid ourselves of the risk of the Willamar Bluff section of pipe failing. We have been working on this process for three years to come up with the best alternative, and I believe that we are there today. 
The results of if we do not proceed with this project could be catastrophic. But the thing is, all of us in the Comox Valley all depend on the proper conveyance and treatment of our sewage. It treats the sewage from our schools, from our hospital, other institutions, our sports and aquatic centers, and the businesses within the valley that we all depend on. While it is only those that live and reside or own property within town of Comox, City of Courtney, the Comox First Nation and the Department of National Defense that will pay for this conveyance project. So we really encourage you to really consider the information we've presented. We feel we have a sound proposal, but obviously you have questions and concerns and we're there to respond to them. The Sewage Commission is made up of three representatives from the City of Courtney, three from the Town of Comox, and a member from the Department of National Defense. There is also a member of the Comox First Nation that sits as a, as a member to provide input, and all of their agendas and considerations are provided to KFN for their input. But also, when it comes to any matter that pertains to Area B, the Sewage Commission has your elected representative, Arzina Hamir, there at the table to voice your concerns. So that is an avenue for you, and any correspondence can be met, made or presented to the Sewage Commission that ultimately makes these presentations. Coming forward will be an alternate approval process, and that will be for the purposes of enabling us to borrow the money in order to conduct this project. The alternative approval process is the opportunity for those that object that would otherwise be paying for the project to, to sign a petition. That will be only open to those that are um, on the system that will be subject to paying it. So the, the residents and businesses within the town of Comox and the city of Courtney. So as an Area B resident, please provide your questions and your input to us. We're interested in answering them. We hope to gain your support. We hope that we have done things right and we're open to your input. Okay, we have some, some questions I haven't gotten to. Uh, they're a little bit technical, but I think let's just try and tackle them right now while we've got uh, everyone here in the room. Um, so Chris, uh, the question is, let's see, the size of the pipe and the maximum gallons per minute in the future. So another sort of growth hypothetical future question, but do you want to give that one a go? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, the final the final sizing of the pipe will be determined through the detailed design process. So that that's some time off. But for the purposes of um, developing the concept and the cost estimate, um, we're looking at a approximately a thirty four inch diameter pipe. Um, so that's that's. But but again, that that diameter could change a little bit uh, through the detailed design process as the contractor. Um, optimizes the design um, and, and and could be impacted a little bit by the type of material as different materials have uh, have a different wall thickness. Although the pipe is likely to be steel given the length. Um, in terms of the the uh, the throughput, um, the, the volumetric flow per day, um, I guess, I mean, the root cause of the question is probably just a, a wondering about, uh, about how much growth is being um, accommodated. So Early on in the process, a key part of the liquid waste management planning process is um, is developing um, kind of growth projections and um, projections for you know, corresponding projections for how much wastewater will be uh, generated by the community. So the um, projections go out to um, effectively the the length of of the the lifespan of the pipe, so the sixty to eighty year time frame. And so we've we've worked closely with our municipal partners to develop the projections for growth. Over that time frame, and um, and that size of pipe is expected to be able to handle that development. That the 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 wastewater flows from that scale and length of development. Okay, Chris, we are getting close to uh, we're nearing six o'clock. Uh, so I would encourage anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question to drop it into the chat now. As mentioned. Um, there are lots of ways to connect with the project team. I'm actually gonna put up a quick slide here just so that you have that email and you can get in touch that way. Let's make sure. Um, let's see, I've gotta make sure I, I'm going to skip that actually. I'll pull that up in a second, but um, so anyone who hasn't asked a question, now is your chance to type it in there. Um, obviously, this is an important topic. There are lots of comments, lots of concerns, and, and people looking for more information. So um, 
and lots of us still on the call. So let's just tackle, I see, I'm gonna grab the last one. Um, you know, it has been a theme. People are concerned, of course, if an accident happens. Chris, can you speak to the timing if uh, the pipe broke or if there was a, a sewage leak? Um, how long would it take for chemicals or the, the sewage matter to pump into the aquifer? I mean, how quickly do these fixes take place? How quickly, there are a lot of questions around monitoring. Um, how immediate is the, is the monitoring when there is a leak? Maybe just let's revisit that because it's definitely on people's minds. Sure, so maybe um, addressing the last piece first. So in terms of leak detection, so how quickly would we know about it? So in order to, to respond. So as I highlighted in the presentation, we committed to assessing options and, and um, for leak detection and, and we're, we're, we're doing that. Um, you know, what, what we're looking at options for real-time monitoring and finding that um, that uh, options are, are, are relatively scarce now, although there are some uh, improvements in technology that are expected shortly. In the interim, you know, as a minimum, We've been we've been making regular use of uh, acoustic leak detection instruments, so that would be sent through on a periodic basis to listen for the, the acoustic signature of a leak. So that's something we've been doing a lot of with our with our major water mains and uh, and the sewer uh, the sewer force main. Um, but that being said, we um, we are working to assess the options for real time monitoring to reduce that response time, and so that uh, so so some options there would be. Um, so what, what we will definitely be doing is installing, you know, ports at either end of the tunneled section that will allow insertion and um, and uh, extraction of um, of that uh, acoustic leak detection system, uh, and then also provision or insertion of a in in the near future a, a real time monitoring device such as uh, a um, fiber optic based type system that would be strung between the two. Um, which would which would listen for the again for the acoustic signature of the of the of the presence of a leak. Um, so in terms of response time, um, so sorry, maybe back to the, the beginning. I think what what Gilles has has assessed through his analysis to date, which is still ongoing, but that given the the um, the density of the sands and the distance between the pipe and the groundwater below. Which, which I mentioned in the presentation is on the order of a minimum of 10 to 12 meters. Um, you, you, you could expect it to take between weeks and months for wastewater to get you know, from the, the location of a leak um, through that highly compacted dry uh, sand layer and down into the, into the drinking water aquifer, at which point it would start to propagate, propagate quicker. But what Jules has also highlighted is that as it passes through those tens of meters of ten, you know, ten plus meters of, of, of media, it's 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 being filtered, and there are biological um, and uh, and chemical processes taking place, which would um, which would, you know, to a large extent, reduce the um, the um, toxicity or the impact of that wastewater when it does get down to below. So, but in terms of the the question, the response time, weeks to months. Um, in the meantime, the CBRD would be doing it would be doing everything possible to respond as quickly as possible and and resolve the problem. In the meantime, implementing you know strengthening the existing monitoring to you know in the proximity to the leak to monitor for the presence of those uh, parameters that Gilles mentioned in terms of the salinity and conductivity being two of the primary ones, but also nutrients. Uh, to to monitor for the for the for the presence of of, of, of wastewater proxies, uh, and then as you know, Russell and I both highlighted, if any of that monitoring did or indicate the presence of wastewater, then we'd be fully responsible for pr provision of a safe uh, a safe and healthy water source. And this is of course in the interim while an expedited repair would be would be um, implemented. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to pop the slide up with the email for um, additional questions directed to the CBRD. If you have questions that pertain to your exact property address, feel free to get in touch on those. That might be the best venue. I'm seeing some of those in the chat. I'm seeing some more technical questions in the chat. 
around cost comparisons. And I think in the interest of time and uh, perhaps Chris's energy level, that's a good hour and a half of uh, a deep dive as promised into groundwater concerns, questions, issues related to the chosen conveyance group. So I hope you've had um, a good chance to find out what you came to find out. I hope you can get in touch with the project team um, to have additional questions answered. I hope you can share this recording with your neighbors if they weren't able to join you today on the Zoom and watch for any questions that didn't get tackled. We've got a list here that we will be answering and posting onto Connect CVRD. So with that, I want to thank all of you for sharing your afternoon evening time with us to learn about this important project. I want to thank obviously Chris for your time and energy and all of the project team from the CVRD and that will be uh, a wrap on today's webinar. Thank you again for being part of this session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you.